Howdy, folks. Great to be with you again. You know, I love hearing that music. It touches me every time and reminds me I get to be with our Thrive family again. And so welcome back, Freedom Portal members. And also welcome to all of the new viewers and listeners who are tuning in today on YouTube, Rumble, Odyssey, and Telegram. So one of the great joys about hosting the Freedom Portal is that I get to share with whoever's interested <laughs> around the world, um, the greatest individuals that I have found who are leading the way to a civilization based on truth and freedom. And today is one of the ones I'm most proud of. This, this is a pre-recorded session. I'm live right now. I'll be hosting live all day. Um, and But there's, the session is pre-recorded only because Rajiv Malhotra, who is the guest for today, had to leave for India to do a month-long tour for his new book, which you'll hear described in the conversation. So Rajiv and I talked, and we both really wanted to capture a good, long, rich conversation before he left. And then he will also be back with us on the 29th of this month with two other key figures in the ethical AI movement. And so you'll get to actually interact with him in person. And we'll have, I invite you to put your questions as you go along today, put them in the Q&A. We'll be collecting those. If there's some that I can answer on my own, I'll do that uh, at the end of the recording. And then we'll be collecting those for him when he comes on uh, at the end of the month. So this guy, I'm, I'm only gonna say one thing about him uh, because I, I'll actually introduce him in the recording. But this guy, I just wanna say he's one of the most important, brilliant and ethical individuals I have ever encountered. And I don't say that lightly. And I, I've looked, as you know, all over the world. If we can create a future of harmonious, non-coercive use of AI, it will be a reflection of the wisdom and kindness of people like this, of Rajiv Malhotra. So before we get going, Leandro, good to see you again. Welcome back. Good to see you, Foster, and good to be back in the Freedom Portal with all of you. That's always my favorite part of the week, no, no doubt. Um, after months of traveling, I'm finally back in Texas, so it's good to be, uh, you know, here and reconnecting with y'all. <laughs> so, um, Leandro's adventures continue. I have to share with you that he's been <laughs> on the road for a while, and he's pulled off broadcasting this show from the, all over the place with every possible sort of uh, setup. And today he's in a uh, in a cafe. Uh, with really good Wi-Fi, and we've got backup um, with Kalen. Uh, but if you see a, a different background for him today, it's a live, it's a live background, and so far it's been successfully soundproof. So uh, thanks for pulling it off, no matter what, uh, uh, Leandro. And before we jump in, I want to just have, get your quick reflections. You know, you were there for the recording. It was your first exposure directly to Rajiv. What impressions do you remember from actually being in the conversation live? R Rajiv is such an important figure in this movement right now. And there, there's a couple big things I really felt like were <clears throat> incredibly interesting to me. Um, for, for one, you know, uh, Foster and I, we, we've always really appreciated how we come from very different walks of life, but have arrived at like, you know, the same point of truth. Uh, and so, you know, that's kind of when you uh, when you feel like you really have something. And this is another example of um, Foster, seeing Foster and Rajiv come together with their different perspectives. Um, obviously, Rajiv uh, having a very deep understanding of things in the U.S., but also being able to um, to bring things forth from, um, you know, the Indian perspective. Um, it's just really interesting because, you know, the, the freedom and liberty movement is so U.S. centric um, to hear Rajiv uh, kind of bring things uh, forward and, you know, share things from an Indian perspective that that align almost perfectly. It's just, it's, um, it's really special to listen to. Um, it just makes you think that, you know, we are coming to a, a point of coalescence um, across the world of like legitimate principles that do represent the way forward for humanity, right? Um, the other thing I really love about Rajiv is that, you know, we have, we've had guests on like, um, like David Icke or like Max Egan, who are really important characters in terms of um, pushing the envelope 
and, uh, you know, really, um, uh, you know, kind of stretching um, out with their, um, you know, uh, their interpretations of what's, what's going on right now and their speculations. And we need those people to blaze those trails. Uh, but we also need people like Rajiv, who's just one of those extremely grounded uh, people that can just explain like what's happening right now, like in concrete terms, like as it as it actually is right now, <laughs> like in ways that is just extremely clear, understandable, and impossible to argue with. So um, I think he can definitely um, represent like one of the most important figures in um, making this movement go more worldwide and like really take root internationally. So um, yeah, I, I'm excited to watch this conversation again because there's so many nuggets, and I'm sure I'm going to pick up different things than I did last time. So yeah, me too. <laughs> well, thank you for that, and. Uh, also, let me remind all the viewers and listeners that we will be closing the public platforms a little less than halfway through this chat. This will be a full on two hour interview uh, and a little less than halfway through. We'll be closing those and Leandro will uh, give instructions on how to move over to the Freedom Portal uh, uh, website and actually register for a free trial to come in and join the rest of the conversation. It also gives you a week to go through all the archives and check out the Freedom Portal uh, and see if it's something that you're interested in. You know, astoundingly, our conversion rate for people who try this out, you know, try out the free week, uh, week long trial and so forth, um, is consistently over 85%. So, uh, I think that indicates that we're producing something that is of value to people in their lives. So we, if you're new to this, I hope you enjoy the first part of this and then come over, join the rest of it and sign up for your free trial. And we'll, we'll show you clearly how to do that with step-by-step -step slides when the time comes. Okay, and then, um, yeah, we'll, I'll do a brief Q&A uh, at the end. I'll show you some of the, the things that are upcoming. Um, but we'll pretty much run the interview all the way through. When we close the public platforms, it'll take a few minutes for people to get over. So I'll use that time to do a little bit of commentary on what we've heard so far and just some of my reflections on further conversations with Rajiv. Both Kimberly and I are in the middle of reading some of his amazing um, books right now. And so I'll just share whatever comments feel appropriate while people are moving over. All right, then without further ado, Leandro. Let's meet Rajiv Malhotra. Well, welcome everyone. This is Foster Gamble here, and I have the great honor today to dive really deep with one of the most remarkable thinkers that I have come across. Uh, his name is Rajiv Malhotra, and he's a scientist, a philosopher, and historian. He's also a highly successful technology entrepreneur, a cultural leader, and an author. Rajiv was trained initially as a physicist and then went on to study computer science, specializing in AI back in the 1970s. And then after a successful corporate career in the US, he became an entrepreneur and founded and ran several IT companies uh, in different countries around the world. Since the early 1990s, as the founder of his nonprofit Infinity Foundation in Princeton, New Jersey, he's been researching civilizations and their engagement with technology from a historical, social sciences, and mind sciences perspective. Now, on a very personal note, I got to say, this was like meeting a brother from another mother for me, because those of you who know my work, uh, it fits in the category of what Bucky Fuller called a comprehensivist. Uh, since I was a child, I've been obsessed with finding and showing how all the different pieces fit together. It's like my entire life I've been climbing this mountain to get the largest possible 360 degree worldview. And then as I near the top, I come up over this ridge and here's this handsome Indian man. <laughs> and he yeah. says, hello, what, what are you doing here? <laughs> <laughs> and so it's been absolutely delightful to just begin to explore with Rajiv the many areas that we touch together and not just as a, a, an intellectual uh, pastime, but because it's so critical right now. I mean, Bucky Fuller said, without comprehensivists, humanity will go extinct. It's a, it's a, there's a danger in over-specializing. So some people need to be keeping track of how the specialties fit together. So 
Um, Rajiv has written numerous best-selling books. His last book uh, was titled Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Power, Five Battlegrounds. And in this book, India becomes the case study to analyze the impact of AI in a variety of domains. And I told Rajiv, I, I, I had the pleasure of reading this book in the past couple of months, and I told Rajiv when I met him that I honestly feel that this is one of probably the three or four most important books on the planet right now. And that's a big claim. So uh, we're gonna spend a couple of hours uh, where I get to show you why I think that, that, that not only this book, but uh, Rajiv's perspective is so critical right now. Now, Rajiv has written another book that we're gonna be getting into in great depth later on uh, called Snakes in the Ganga. And, uh, but we're gonna start by going a little bit into Rajiv's personal life and then a little bit into the past book before bringing it up to date on the book that's just about to come up. And I know Rajiv is going to be beginning a, a tour of India shortly. So a long winded introduction, but uh, Rajiv, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you, Foster. Uh, it, it's actually uh, delightful to, to meet you. I wish I had met you decades ago. Uh, and I have to tell people that the two documentaries that you sent me are absolutely amazing. And I would like to, when we put this up on our channel, I would like to uh, give the links to these and recommend everybody should watch them because these are mind blowing. These bring out so much new knowledge, so much technology, so much philosophy, uh, world affairs. So Foster, I, I, I feel that uh, you are a king, kindred spirit and uh, uh, my uh, work and yours are, have a huge overlap. Uh, so I'm really looking forward to uh, collaborating in, in serious ways uh, with you. And thank you for having me on this show and th thank you for taking the initiative uh, and we'll get started now. All right, well, it's a great pleasure to, to have you on. And I know that you and I are probably used to in conversation, sort of being careful in different areas of, okay, how can I, how deep can I go? You know, how much does a, is a person aware of and so forth. And this is one of those rare conversations where I know we can simply go anywhere. And I want to go right to the core to begin with uh, in your personal life and ask you really fundamentally, what is your purpose in life these days? So, you know, since childhood, I have had this quest for understanding the higher truth. And I have had a philosophical side and a scientific side and trying to bring them together. Uh, you know, the science can also be very material and pragmatic, and I have that side in me. But I also want to understand what is happening in the universe? Why does it exist? How does it work? Uh, I, I've asked fundamental questions like, is the universe an algorithm? Well, if it's an algorithm, which it seems to be to a large extent because the laws are being obeyed in a very systematic way, then what about free will? Is there something beyond algorithms? Is it, do, is it both partly an algorithm and partly beyond algorithms? And, and if we are conditioned to behave in an algorithmic way, uh, with, with, you know, in a causation way, cause, effect, cause, effect, we are trapped in this causation, uh, then how do we get out of it? Is there life beyond this causation? So I've had this uh, not only as a theoretical quest, reading a lot, but also in, through my own meditation and through my own practices experientially. I've had the, the uh, great uh, fortune of uh, meeting some, of the, some important people, spiritual exemplars, we call them gurus, many of them, and learning from them and, and practicing these things in a very serious way. So my purpose in life, which in our tradition is called Sva Dharma. Dharma is the Dharma, but Sva means my Dharma, which means it's like you have my favorites or my something. So this is like my Dharma, meaning everybody has a Sva Dharma, but different people could have a different Sva Dharma. My Sva Dharma is to exp experiment different processes for higher states of consciousness uh, and pursue them. Uh, and perfect myself in a higher and higher state of consciousness as much as I can in this life uh, to be a better person and give back to society. Uh, at both uh, evolve myself as an inner being, which is which in the in, in our tradition is called adhyatma, the inner being. And in the Western tradition, you might call it mind sciences and consciousness studies. Uh, and also in the outer realm, which could could be translated as social sciences or uh, the Lokika world, the outward, outer world, 
So I want to excel, but the, the key is to improve oneself through various practices, uh, evolve one's consciousness, and then take this higher inner being into the outer world. And not a outer world driven by a selfish ego, but an outer world from a higher place. So this is, in a nutshell, my calling. And I'm delighted to be here to share it with you. Wonderful. Well, on a, continuing on, on a personal note, um, at some point, as you were going along in your studies of physics and metaphysics and philosophy and engineering and so forth, at some point, there must have been a kind of a turning where you realize that the world wasn't quite what you were being told by the media, by the government, by the universities and so forth. Is there a particular kind of a red pill moment when, that, that woke you up to looking deeper than people usually do? Yes. So I had a quest all the time, uh, both the theory and the practice. But you know, I was such a type A, hardworking businessman, successful, running around the world, uh, lucky I never had a heart attack or didn't get kidnapped. And these were the days when, you know, I used to go to the e Eastern Europe and I'd go to, go to China, go to Korea, uh, go to uh, all these European countries and run my businesses and get there on the red eye at eight o'clock in the morning, seven o'clock and start working 15, 20 hours through meals and then fly off to another country. So I did all that. And, you know, <laughs> because I was doing well, so I figured, you know, wow, you know, I can keep, uh, keep uh, adding more uh, materially. But then there was always this inner quest that said, you know, at some point I got to give up. I got to let go of this because I'm not here for that. I'm just here to be self-sufficient so I don't have to be in this game all the time. And, and what happened was a combination of events that kind of were, were the tipping point. Uh, in the outer world sense, in, I, I was on the one hand making a ton of money. Uh, on the other hand, I was getting disillusioned by the quality of people that I was with because they couldn't see life beyond just making more money. And I didn't think that that was the end of life. So we would have some conflicts, some conflicts over ethics. Uh, uh, so I, I, I had this kind of a bit of a disillusionment and I kept asking myself, why do I need to go through all this anymore? And then the other part of it was uh, spiritual in encounters. I always looked out for people who are spiritually advanced to get to learn more from them. So as a result of uh, some people in the family introducing me to a great spiritual master who is no more in the body uh, in Mumbai, in a very humble quarters, uh, I got to know this person. And immediately there was such an experience I had uh, in a series of encounters. The experiences are beyond words, beyond description. It's sort of like, uh, you know, they say the silence of the Buddha upon having his nirvana. Uh, he didn't speak because whenever people asked a question, he didn't, there was no words to explain it. So he was just silent. Not that he was trying to uh, avoid them, but he just didn't know how to say it. And then, of course, he started teaching a lot. So I had my moment of that silence. It wasn't 40 days or something like in his case, but it was there for a while. Uh, and so when I was flying back from Mumbai to the United States, the, it was becoming very clear to me that when I go back there, I'm going to just give up all this stuff and I'm going to pursue this because I've experienced something that ought to be, I ought to know more about it. I ought to pursue it more seriously. So when I, I remember when I came back, I got my top uh, eight, 10 people around the table and I said, you know what, by the end of this year, I'm going to be out of all this. And they thought, you know, this guy, I mean, he's running around the world. Come on, you know, what, maybe, maybe he'll get over this in a few days. So they thought that I, some people thought I have a midlife crisis. One guy suggested I should meet a psychiatrist whom he knows. So people couldn't get it that I really have had enough of this. Now I want to get out and I want to do something else because I've discovered, I've experienced. And so I want to pursue that. But that's what I did. And I never looked back. And that was almost 30 years ago. I never looked back. Mm -hmm. And people for several years kept thinking that, you know, he's up to something. He's developing a new secret business somewhere. And, you know, one of these days, and he didn't want to tell us, they kept offering me, do you want to be on this board? And do you want to invest here, there? And, you know, I didn't have any interest. So as a result of all that, you know, here I am. <laughs> it's like cosmic entrepreneurship. You were investing in the unified field. <laughs> okay, so um, we're going to talk a lot today about artificial intelligence, particularly because of the 
really critical role that it plays in the future of humanity. Whichever road humanity goes down, artificial intelligence is going to be a critical part of it, for better or for worse. I'm a big fan of artificial intelligence, and I'm also very concerned about artificial intelligence if we don't relate to it accurately. So for the audience out there, let's start in at the basics. What, from your perspective, is artificial intelligence? So, you know, artificial intelligence, and this should not be mixed up with artificial consciousness. Mm -hmm. uh, artificial consciousness is, uh, or consciousness, uh, intelligence and consciousness are two different things. And then we can say what is artificial intelligence and what might be possibly artificial consciousness, which doesn't exist. So intelligence and consciousness are very different and you can have one without the other. Uh, you can have you can have a, an intelligent entity which is not conscious. So, for instance, when I'm sleeping, I'm not conscious, but there's a whole lot of metabolism going on. Uh, my body is functioning. My pancreas are functioning. There's a lot of intelligent behavior, very, very precise, like a machine working unconsciously. So there is unconscious intelligence in all of us. And the cosmos has both conscious beings and unconscious inanimate intelligent entities and processes going on. So there is one without the other. You can also have, con you can be conscious, there could be a conscious entity which has more intelligence or less intelligence. There are different, there's a whole spectrum of levels of intelligence for conscious beings. So the two are kind of separate. Of course, consciousness is primary and consciousness manifests itself in inanimate and animate uh, and different levels of different levels of intelligence. So I, I would want to separate the before talking about artificial intelligence. I want to not bring in consciousness because people ask questions like people wonder if machines aren't conscious, how could they be smarter than us? Well, smart being smart is different than being conscious. Uh, you can have an algorithm uh, to recognize faces, which actually outperforms human beings, uh, which can recognize faces more precisely than human beings, recognize them in the dark recognize them wearing a hat and with a beard, they can recognize the same face. Uh, so if you think of facial recognition as an intelligent process, you can have machines that outperform. If you consider driving uh, requiring some kind of intelligence, then you know you can have machines that can drive better than human beings, maybe faster, maybe in different raining conditions, maybe in different traffic conditions, uh, you know, and they can keep learning and outperform human beings. So you can have intelligence in machines that keeps evolving and outperforms human beings. So artificial intelligence, uh, given my software background, I want to explain it in this way. When in, in conventional software, which is before AI, normal software, the human trains the machine what to do. So the human says, here is how you do payroll. And the machine cannot learn, become smarter at it. It cannot, uh, it, there's no such thing as machine learning where the machine figures out how to do payroll on its own. So I have to teach the machine how to do payroll. And if the rules change, then I have to change my program. I have to update my program. Uh, so the human programmer it literally teaches every step that the machine should carry out. And that's normal software. Artificial intelligence is when the machine has been set up in such a way that through its own experience, it can become smarter and smarter and smarter. It can self learn. So it self learns through experience. And this experience is called big data. So you, you have a whole lot of experiential data that you throw through the machine. So you show it, uh, you know, uh, the right way to do something, the wrong way to do something. And the machine keeps figuring out patterns and patterns and patterns of how to do it right, what to avoid, what to, what to not avoid. And, and, and it keeps getting feedback on how is it doing. In many ways, machines learn like children. So when a child is, uh, begin, tries to get up and it falls, the, the, the memory in the muscle uh, learns, you know, I did it this way and it didn't work out. So next time I'm going to try a little bit differently. And maybe after trying several different ways, it realizes that this is the way I move my muscles and it's a little more successful. So the child is encouraged and says, aha, it's working. And now the child tries how to do it in, in a more successful way. And it keeps getting negative feedback, positive feedback, and it records it in its muscle memory until it's able to stand up. And this is how we learn everything. So neuro neuroscientists, 
and uh, and uh, uh, software people collaborated to figure out models of how learning happens and that is why uh, there are these neural networks even the vocabulary in ai has got some some resemblance with neurology because the idea is to figure out how the human beings how the brain learns and then figure out how do we set up machines that can keep learning so what is distinct about artificial intelligence is that is the ability for machines to learn on their own now this is phenomenal because you know if the machine can learn on its own uh, it could actually learn more than we do because we've put this machine together and it can keep learning i will die but this machine keep learning i, I and also think of it this way if you have a thousand people human beings driving a car and each of them they're driving separate cars each of them is learning how to drive better and better so somebody with 20 years experience is better he's learned a lot and then as he as life goes by he has more and more experience but the experience of one driver is not shared by the others mm -hmm. i don't become smarter when faster you have learned something about driving it doesn't help me because you there is no cloud where all of our experiences get shared whereas in the case of driverless cars all the cars that are going driving around with sensors learning how to drive what to do what to avoid what causes an accident all of that is shared in the cloud so all the cars get the benefit of each other's experience so there's collective learning in ai which is very difficult for human beings we have language and we do learn from each other but it's not the same efficiency the second thing is that when a machine dies when a car dies it's discarded it's its learning is not lost. It's not like the next car has to start as a child and learn all over. The next car adopts and inherits all the learning of the predecessors. Similarly, we try to do that through lineages. We leave back books and so that the next generation don't have to go through the same thing. But it's not, we haven't learned yet to transplant human memory into another person. So imagine if you, you could not, you could first of all merge the memory of Foster and Rajiv and all of that, a whole lot of people in a way that, you know, there could be a collective memory that everybody can access. And secondly, if you could transplant it to another person, another generation, you would have, you would have a whole, you know, different level of learning than is currently possible. In the case of machines, this is artificially being kind of simulated, not exactly to the extent I'm talking about, but it is being simulated to some extent and getting better all the time. So you will see, you are seeing that AI is galloping ahead because of these advantages, because of the cumulative memory and because of the, uh, uh, the shared experiential uh, learning that uh, machines are having. So that's kind of my idea of uh, artificial intelligence and uh, what makes it, uh, what makes it uh, hugely uh, a big, one of the biggest uh, breakthroughs and discoveries that human beings ever made. And at the same time, also potentially very dangerous. So let's go into the benefits first of all. Can you just give a couple of concrete examples of the benefits to human beings of artificial intelligence? Yeah, this is wonderful. So, you know, one of the most interesting areas is medicine. Uh, you know, a lot of the human knowledge of doctors and nurses and so on is now being put into AI systems so that doctors are less likely to make mistakes and careless mistakes and forget human errors uh, the, more and more the ai system is kind of prompting them you you feed all the symptoms and all the test results and it can tell you the probability of what may happen and what to look for gradually diagnostics is becoming more and more ai driven uh, so medicine is one area and and also uh, discovery of new new medicines uh, looking at the genome, the genome as a program, looking at the genome as a program that is a biological computer, if you will, and doing different, uh, do different, uh, big, throwing big data at it and simulating in the computer how this genome behaves, how to make the genome behave in a way that you think is advantageous. So this is an enormous amount of power which could create uh, havoc also because you could do all sorts of things. But if used properly and ethically, uh, we could cure diseases, we could create a, a multiplier effect for medicine so that you don't have to have doctors in all the poor villages to treat people, but you could treat them algorithmically and from a distance. Uh, you know, in sticking to medicine, uh, surgeons, uh, so much surgery is being done using augmented reality. So if I'm wearing these goggles 
and I've, oh, I've opened this person and I'm doing some surgery, then my eyes are looking at a combination of the real, real blood vessels and the real tissues, superimposed what the x-rays have shown deeper than I'm able to see. So there's two, two visions, two visuals I'm seeing. I'm seeing the actual visual, but superimposed a digital visual to give me some guidance, give me some numbers, tell me some stuff, where to go, what not to do. So that when I'm, when I'm operating on this body, I have the benefit of what traditionally a surgeon has with his eyes, but I also have the benefit of the digital knowledge being superimposed on top of it. So that's, that's the sort of thing that uh, uh, I would give as an example of uh, uh, good use of AI. Another thing is, you know, uh, farming and agriculture to improve food production. Uh, there's a lot of knowledge that a farmer has uh, that doesn't get passed on and then his experience doesn't get transmitted to another farmer somewhere else because it's lost. It's within the confines of a human body. And so when that human body is gone, it's gone. So now AI is uh, monitoring farms in many places to see what's the soil condition, temperature condition, all kinds of things happening, and what are the decisions the farmer has made, when did he plant, when did he not plant, what, what kind of uh, you know, fertilizer he used or whatever seeds, and kind of the AI systems that are getting all these data, correlating with the output, which one did better, which one did worse, able to figure out, learn algorithms for better and better farming. So we are, we are taking the cumulative experience of thousands of farmers, uh, multi-generation, and, and creating this brain that has got more knowledge than ordinary human farmers do. So any, I would say in both medicine and farming, the common thing is accumulating knowledge from multiple experts and beyond their lifespan and making it available to a whole large scale of people in that field. That's, yeah. If you can do it ethically, you know, we could be a better humanity, much better human beings if you could do it ethically. Yeah, those are great examples. And, you know, we could spend time going into education and transportation yes. and space travel. And I, I think really in every area. And that, that's what excites me so much. Uh, now let's look at the other side. What, what are the risks that we're running in developing uh, digital technology that is that can calculate uh, and control things way beyond the human capacity? So that's a great question. So, you know, the area of bias and prejudice, because uh, when there's human judgment, uh, uh, there can be bias, but when you put it into the algorithm, then that bias can be on a much larger scale. Mm. So if uh, it depends on how you train the machine. Uh, if you train the machine using uh, uh, court cases, uh, and in these court cases, people of a certain uh, ethnicity or a certain gender or some kind of some some category of people happen to be uh, in, uh, you know guilty of some crime more often than others then the algorithm correlates it and says okay people of that kind of a profile are higher uh, suspects they're higher level suspects and it could just be that the database is biased that this database is not a normal database but it's a database where uh, people of a certain category were having a higher rate of incarceration and so they are considered uh, suspect and now the algorithm has learned this bias and is perpetuating the bias this has been found to be the case in recruitment uh, people have felt that uh, uh, there's, there's gender bias there's racial bias there's bias on various kinds of grounds so whether it is uh, legal bias or uh, or employment bias bias is one area uh, that, that has a lot of danger. And coming from another civilization or non-Western civilization, I will tell you that AI has not been decolonized properly because a lot of the uh, a lot of the prejudices against my culture have, are in the algorithms of Google, and I keep fighting with them all the time, and Facebook because because sometimes they think something violates community standards because it violates their sensibilities. But from where I come, it's a perfectly normal thing. Uh, and, and, you know, so that's one area of a problem is that the West having more control over the algorithms and the machine train learning unintentionally just happens to be that a lot of the prejudices uh, flow into the algorithms. And then these algorithms are used all over the world. And it's a disconnect for people elsewhere. That's a that's a problem. Second big area. Uh, I see as a problem is 
concentration of power that the the haves and the have nots have uh, the, the the dichotomy between them the pyramid of power has become worse and you, and this is very consistent with your documentaries where you talk about the control of uh, uh, the financial industry you talk about the control of the petrochemicals the control of the pharmaceutical the control of the food chain all of those absolutely brilliantly analyzed by you now imagine that uh, instead of the jp morgan <laughs> and instead of the human uh, you know rothschild uh, and, and all these people now now you have algorithms that have embodied this kind of uh, uh, this ability to create more wealth for their owners and so now it's a force multiplier so it's like a weapon that is not equally available to all you know they might say facebook says okay uh, we will let you 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 tell us all your preferences what ads you want what you don't want and then we are you know, we'll use ai to your advantage and everybody thinks wow this is very good uh, this ai is available to me but the point is that zuckerberg has obviously more rights over this ai than i do uh, right now it's free okay that's nice but in terms of who controls the algorithms who controls how they are being trained what is the criteria for you know using them uh, obviously there's an asymmetry because there are people who are producers of ai and then there are people who are consumers of ai so the producers of a technology have more power than the consumers they are make they are giving it to me as a consumer but i'm not a producer they are the producer they might be they might have something 5 years 10 years ahead of what they're giving to me they might be giving me a scaled down version they might be giving me a distorted version all of that i'm happy and i don't have anything any choices but they and and they they not only stand to make money they stand to control the way the ai will be used so i see ai as the biggest weapon for uh, for an asymmetry of power remember that the east india company which started the colonial enterprise from england uh, and then there was a french east india company they started they became powerful because of the industrial revolution it's the industrial revolution of england everybody says that the industrial revolution is very good because while it killed jobs it also created more jobs but the fact of the matter is it created jobs in england and killed jobs in india uh, the 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 person doing textiles which is one of the greatest uh, exports of india for hundreds of years the person doing textiles by hand was wiped out and in manchester they put all these mills to make the textiles you know uh, in, in an industrial fashion so of course it created jobs in manchester but it killed the jobs of a large number of people in india who used to do that so the industrial revolution brought unprecedented wealth to a few european colon colonial powers and it impoverished a huge you know very large numbers of people elsewhere and so we had this dichotomy between colonizers and colonized and this of course changed the world forever in a very sad, na nasty way we are not even now not fully decolonized uh, because while there is political decol decolonization financially people are still dependent and in terms of the use of language and resources and power they're still dependent so i think this uh, this new industrial revolution as ai is called runs the same risk that just like the industrial revolution of you know electricity electrification of factories and steam engine all that happened now the the new industrialization using ai is not going to be equal it's not going to it's going to be uh, you know google knows how to do things with using ai more efficiently but the guy saying in some village in a poor country he doesn't have that he may end up being a consumer. They may say, we'll give you, we'll let you buy this product from us or this service from us. We might even give it to you free for a while. But in any case, you're buying it or you're getting the benefit at our discretion, at our whim and fancy. And, and you know, and the, the kind of service you're getting and how much you are getting, uh, it depends on us. It depends on our generosity. So you're making the world dependent. In, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a kind of an asymmetric way with some people having all the power. Yeah. Another yeah. advantage, another problem, third one, is psychological manipulation, like social media. So I call it the moronization of the masses, which means you're turning them into morons. So the more and more people becoming morons, but happy morons, if we, they're told that, oh, you're happy, you can, you can watch the movie you want, and 
Uh, you can binge watch, uh, you know, pornography. You can fantasize that you are going uh, to a holiday somewhere. You can do all of those things. Uh, so people are, but people are dumbing down their choice making. You are on autopilot, and Netflix is telling you what's the next movie to watch, and somebody is telling you who's the right dating partner, and somebody is telling you what's the right food to have, which is the recommended uh, restaurant. So you know they are figuring me out. They're figuring out what are what are what are my uh, hot buttons? What am I? What are my desires? What am I likely to respond to? Because the more accurately they can figure me out, the more accurately they give me choices what to buy, and that's how they make their money from advertisers. Advertisers are moving into these AI systems, and that's why the Google and the Facebook people are so rich because they have these algorithms that drive people's behavior in a manner that the person who's paying for the ad or paying for the promotion is going to reward the, the platform so the, the 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 commerce is being driven through these platforms and the consumer is being more his thinking is being molded in a certain direction uh, so he's moving he's becoming more and more uh, buying on default choosing by default default meaning like he doesn't have to make a choice he, it's like being made for him so he's becoming dumbed down he's becoming dumbed down and as long as he thinks that he's doing well dumbed down you know he'll continue getting dumbed down Sad thing is, uh, you know, when I talk to people who are like in their teens or pre-teens, they're very smart, they're very, they know about all these new technologies. I ask them, aren't you concerned about your privacy is, being, is taken and somebody is deciding what to do for you? And they're, they're not concerned. They're saying, well, that's cool. Yeah. So it's become cool to be moron. It's become cool to be uh, kind of somebody who's driven by all this. Uh, as long as you have the latest gadget and the latest, you know, buzzwords, uh, it's cool. So I, I think this, the AI industry is succeeding because they're making their money. Intelligent people don't make good consumers of advertising because intelligent people ask questions. They'll think for themselves. Whereas if you are just lulled into it because it's so aesthetic and so beautiful, the models are beautiful, the music is nice, all those things are promising you sound great and you don't have to do a darn thing. This will all happen for you. You know, you just sit back and you kind of cruise through life. Uh, and this uh, metaverse will make it even more so because now it will be more exciting. So I think that this is the, this modernization of the masses combined with uh, the, the uh, concentration of power with a few people, combined with the, the bias that exists that in AI, when you put all these together, uh, it can be pretty nasty for the future of humanity. Yeah. Well, that's great. Uh, let me, uh, you, you're, you're stepping into some of these battlegrounds and this is what you unpack so beautifully in uh, your last book. And so I want to circle back and go into that a little bit. First of all, I want to share my screen and show everybody what this, uh, what this book looks like so that you can uh, get a hold of it. Uh, Artificial Intelligence and the Future of Power. First time I read that title, uh, I mean, my body just started resonating because it starts building, you know, with artificial and then intelligence is going into the future. And then it nails it with this is all about power. You know, are, are we going to destroy ourselves through our battles over power over each other? Or are we going to actually discover the spiritual power within ourselves and the power of honoring each person's sovereignty. So I want to, what I want to do, you do a great job in the forward to that book of actually uh, doing a succinct summary of each of those five battlegrounds. And I'm going to ask you to do that uh, even more succinctly for this conversation. Uh, so the, the key battlegrounds that Rajiv identifies in this book are, first of all, economic development and jobs. So what do you want to say about that as a battleground for AI? So, you know, economic development will get the benefits that we talked about earlier. Uh, and lots of new jobs will be created in the AI industry. But the concern I have is that this development will not be, uh, not be uh, consistent across all strata. Uh, and the job will be not for, the, for all people. Maybe in Bangalore, they will have a huge amount of development and a huge amount of jobs will be created. But in the hinterlands of India, the jobs will be lost. Uh, 
uh, just like uh, in the United States, Silicon Valley may come out ahead and there'll be more billionaires. But in the, in the Midwest, you know, in the old tech, uh, old manufacturing, old rust belt, people will lose jobs. So I feel that the disruption in the economy and in the employment is going to happen. The new jobs will be there. Now, I don't doubt that. But the new jobs will not go to the same people who lost the old jobs. Some of them are not trainable. Some of them are too late in life to train. And, and who's going to retrain? They say things like, uh, uh, we will retrain the workers. So I went and asked the McKinsey people, I went and asked some of these auditors who put out these reports for their corporate people to sort of hush up the problem. They don't want to uh, create a crisis in, in, the, in the public. So I asked them, when, you, when your client says that, okay, these jobs will be obsolete and these jobs will be created and be retrained, have they set aside the budget required? Uh, are you sure how many months of training it takes per employee or how many years of training? And is there that much budget that they keep paying them the salary and retrain them? And even if they're not as good as the younger people, they will still hire them. Is that part of corporate policy? And the answer is hell no. So it's just, just sort of a nice facade, a nice way to keep you happy and keep you off their case. But real, I mean, it would be more honest if they said that we, when we institutionalize AI, we look at the impact on human beings and we to we fund them that money. We put that money out to take care of the problem. It's sort of like if Pepsi Cola were to say that every time we make a can of Pepsi, we know the environmental cost of cleaning it up because somebody will throw it somewhere. So we are going to allocate X amount of money for every can to go and do the cleanup. And we'll allocate it to some local people who are doing the cleanup in the environment because we are creating the problem by making that can. So if they were, if it were a full life cycle effect, uh, just like in the case of uh, pollution, the a life cycle on the whole environment has to be paid for by somebody. Similarly, in the case of AI, if you look at the entire ecosystem of human beings, what's the effect on the economy? Some industries will die, some industries will be created, uh, jobs, same thing. If they were to put aside actual money, that would be a different goal. That would be a totally different goal. Right now, I'll tell you, one state in India, Tamil Nadu, in the south, has about 5 million jobs in the automobile sector. But this is the old automobile. It's not the electric car. It's not the driverless car. It's the internal combustion engine. So they're making carburetors. They're making spark plugs. And there's all these guys. They're going to be out of work in five, by the second half of this decade, because they're 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 marketing this to the world, the world's largest auto manufacturers in Japan and USA and Europe. They're selling all these things, making them in India. But the fact is, have people gone across national boundaries and looked at the impact and said, "I'm going to make this new thing. It's going to be better for everybody, but there's going to be an effect over there." And those people haven't been told. Nobody's telling them. You see, and I feel very sad for them because they're just ordinary human beings like us. Nobody has told them that your job will be gone like that one day. And, you know, it will be gone to some other place in the world and you don't have anything to say. So that's a that's a problem. It's an opportunity for some. It will make a lot of money and it will create new job opportunities, but it will also harm some people. Well, that's one of the advantages of your being a comprehensive thinker is you're actually looking at the whole system. You're looking at the whole job cycle. You're looking internationally. You're looking actually, is this going to work for the planet? Is this going to work for, the, for humanity, not just for a few or for a particular company? And, and yes, there's the training of jobs. And even a further nuance of that is once they start with neural implants um, yes. and various AI chips and so forth will they hire you if you haven't been chipped if you if you don't have a a, a plant an implant in, in your brain and so forth so it's going to get very complicated and obviously we need a compass to right. be able to navigate the ethics of this and we're going to get into the into that later on but let me go on to the second battleground that you identify in in your last book so the next one is power Sorry. The next one is power in the new world order. What do you mean yeah. by that? I know you were talking a little bit about already about centralization of power, but uh, apply that to the new world order. So I see uh, a new uh, kind of a recolonization of the world uh, with AI. 
just like the previous colonization happened with the previous industrial revolution. So I see that United States and China uh, will become like England and France. You know, Britain and France were the two industrial powers. They're fighting each other, the way US and China are fighting each other, fighting each other for territory, fighting each other for colonies. In fact, you know, there were wars between the British and French in India. Uh, they would, they would uh, bring in Indian soldiers on their side and the French would bring in Indian soldiers on their side and they're fighting for territory. Uh, so I see the United States and China being like Britain and France, fighting each other, fighting each other for world power, but also recolonizing. China has a lot of colonial imp uh, footprints in Africa, Pakistan, many kinds of countries that they've taken over almost. And United States has its uh, sphere of influence. So my, I feel that uh, uh, the, the new world order will be kind of polarized into different camps and AI will be a huge weapon uh, in, in order to organize these, uh, organize this power. Not to talk about the actual militarization uh, of, uh, of the battlefield in a physical sense, in terms of the, uh, you know, AI robotic soldiers and drones and all kind of, you know, intelligent devices that are far more dangerous than human beings. So power in the new, there'll be a new world order. It'll be, uh, it'll be a whole new system of power. And uh, the, the, they, this will all be AI driven. Yeah, they, and th I want us to pause on this one for a minute because it's so huge. Uh, if, and there are people out there in the audience who are not familiar with the term, the new world order, you know, check out Rajiv's books, check out uh, the Thrive documentaries, because this, this is a very real agenda. It's beyond any particular individual or organization. It's an agenda to control the entire planet, all the resources and all of humanity. Now that's a big task. It used to be impossible, even though it's what all the, the psychopathic dictators have always dreamt of, it's becoming more and more feasible looking to the people who wake up in the morning thinking, how can I keep my fear at bay by controlling everyone and, and everything? And the answer is because the technology allows for the possibility of complete surveillance, of full, full spectrum dominance, as they call it. It allows for what some call quiet weapons for silent wars, uh, where we can be colonized, taken over, controlled without even knowing that it's happening because there aren't bombs dropping out of the air, but our businesses are being closed or our vaccines are being uh, mandated or we've, uh, we've had our inflation uh, in the economy, which has destroyed the purchasing power of our currencies and so forth. And these are all very well thought out schemes to create a new order, which is basically the old socialist, communist, fascist, complete dictatorship, but with no one to come to the rescue, at least no one from this planet. That, that's the plan to create a global technocracy and use AI for the social credit score, to monitor people's bank accounts, monitor their movement, monitor their emotions and so forth, to monitor everything and then to be able to control it, where if you don't go along with their agenda, then they can impact you instantly. They can shut off your, your bank account. They can, uh, if you've got a neural chip, they can affect your emotions, they can affect your thoughts and so forth. So it's a very scary, possibility that some people are very sincerely going after. So when, when Rajiv is talking about power in the new world order as a battlefield for artificial intelligence, uh, this one is really, really critical to all of our futures. So let's go on to the third one. So, so on this yeah. one, on this one, I think it's good to remind people that my next book, which we'll talk about snakes in the yes. Ganga, actually to, goes into this in a, and you, you have some slides on that. Actually, the, that goes into the, this new world order thing, uh, the globalists and all that stuff in a, in a whole, the whole 800 page book on that topic. Yeah, that's why I'm so excited to have some real time to dive in with, because I, I, I wanted to, to get a, a sense of your personal path and then to dive into the this scenario that you have been laying out and we will do that and then we'll go into the to the content as well of the next book and then we will, will in this conversation we'll focus on uh solutions well what's what are the ways out of this because i think we're on the same page very much 
in terms of what's possible in that regard as well. And frankly, most people aren't even thinking in those terms yet. Right. Okay, so let's go on to number three in the key battlegrounds of artificial intelligence. And this is the psychological. You've already touched on that. Do you want to say any more about that? Yes. So, so this, is, this, is where, uh, this is where the uh, uh, psychological control of desires has to do with the modernization of the masses, uh, feeding, gratifying the person through uh, AI-based social media, AI-based uh, you know, interactive media. Uh, the, the, this uh, metaverse is going to be taking us to the next generation of uh, uh, having the desires met. But as I satisfy more and more desires through some platform that I've subscribed to, I actually turn over my agency to them. Because, you know, it's like, uh, I don't need to do much. They're taking care of me. It's having, I'm having a good time. I just relax and everything is being done for me. And, you know, I'm on cruise control. <laughs> and so what has happened is that I lose my faculties. I, they atrophy. They atrophy. I'm no longer, uh, I, I don't know, don't have too much judgment. And I don't even know if I had a judgment, what, how to exercise it because I lost this control. So this is, this is what psychological... Uh, uh, programming is doing to humanity on a very large scale and it's happening rapidly. This is what my wife and creative partner Kimberly calls creepily convenient. They're making it so convenient that we can easily become very lazy and, and begin to succumb. And then by the time you start to wake up, if you do at all, uh, there's no longer any choice. What was, what was convenient is now mandatory. You know, okay, so what, go ahead. You know, while researching for this, I came across some consultants who very proudly shared with me that they actually specialize in teaching the AI companies how to psychologically control control the consumer. I mean, there's, there, there's, 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 there are actually metrics, there are actually measurements to see how, uh, which person has been, is responding to us more, uh, uh, how much is he trusting us, our choices, their scores. And the algorithms are rated based on how good a job they're doing. And there's competitions on how to develop better algorithms to uh, uh, make the people more psychologically controlled by you. So this is a very scientific engineering pursuit being perfected. Yeah, this goes to the work of Edward Bernays and the, uh, on propaganda. And the whole thing is social engineering. It's applying yeah. mechanical principles as best they can to actually get inside our psyches and have us willingly go along with their agenda in ways that we would not if we were thinking critically and understood what's really going on. So, yeah. so to begin to refine our agency and to discover some ways out of this, let's go on to the next battleground, which you identify as the metaphysics. Oh, I'm clicking too many buttons here. So we've gone the economic, the power, the psychological, and now the metaphysics of the self and its ethics. Please talk about that. So, you know, I was raised in this whole field of consciousness evolution. Uh, and and, and pe there are so many people in the yoga movement, in the meditation movement, uh, uh, and, and they are into techniques to raise your consciousness to higher, higher levels of consciousness. And we saw the future of humanity as a, uh, as a path of higher consciousness. So we are becoming less egotistical, less, uh, you know, contained within the biological machine of the human body, uh, tapping into cosmic energies, cosmic forces and evolving. So that's one path. And now there is a path which contradicts that and competes against that, which says that the way human beings will become more functional is through implants, through algorithms that are inside, not just outside, Firstly, there were algorithms outside on my desktop and my handheld, and they are running my life. And then there are algorithms where you, I wear goggles and they're even closer and more intimate. And then the next stage is they come inside me and they're implanted. But all these algorithms, wherever they are outside or inside, they are controlled by other people. The average guy who's the consumer of all this is not, he doesn't know anything what's happening. They're controlling him. So what we are develop, what we are having is a a competition, a conflict between the two parts of evolution of the self. One is uh, the natural consciousness evolution. Uh, the other is a controlled, industrialized, 
uh, advancement of uh, the human performance uh, using artificial means. Uh, and the, the latter seems to have won the last decade. Uh, prior to AI, uh, everybody was very confident that, you know, this consciousness movement is the future of humanity and we won't have dictators and negative guys and bad guys because everybody will be evolved and they will see sense in uh, not trying to micro optimize for their own selfish goal, but for all of humanity. That's what we were hoping would happen. But now suddenly the technology has made it possible for the, the greedy people, the selfish people, the megalomaniacs, that this technology uh, will allow them to control a large number of people. So that's the frontier of ethics, I think, is the, uh, the self versus the biological enhanced, artificially enhanced machine. Am I, am I a self? Or am I this machine? And if I'm a self, then should I be evolving that self, uh, you know, not dependent on this machine, but independent of it, higher than it? Uh, if to the extent I'm a machine, I should be buying all the latest gadgets to help me uh, evolve my, uh, advance my performance. So that's the conflict, that's the battleground that I'm talking about. Okay, great. And we're going to explore that in depth uh, very soon. Um, but let's go on to the fifth one. Um, in your book, you use India as an example of this battleground, and I think it's a particularly uh, appropriate one. Why do you see India as a particularly important battleground for this, uh, this challenge between the self and the robot? <laughs> you know, India is important because India brought to the world this whole consciousness idea in the 60s and even before, based on very ancient rishis and yogis. So India is, a, India is a, known to be a place that should champion that. And when India gets compromised, then that whole movement is threatened. And the reason India is compromised is that this new materialistically driven, billionaire driven, uh, you know, uh, kind of a greedy, uh, uh, AI driven, mechanized, uh, you know, advancement of human performance has entered India. Uh, Indians are the largest uh, contingent of uh, AI engineers in the world. I mean, most people don't know this, but if you look at the places like Google and Facebook and Microsoft and all that, they have tens of thousands of people of Indian origin, not only living in Silicon Valley, working for these companies, but also their subsidiaries in Bangalore and Hyderabad and other places. So the Indians are the brains or among the large, a large percentage of the brains being used uh, but they are being brainwashed. These young people are being trained, not in 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 uh, ethically in consistent with their own heritage, not with the values of their own background, but kind of being westernized in this in this sense. And the compensation is very good. Some of them make lots of money. Uh, you know, you see the CEO of Google and the CEO of Microsoft and all kinds of other places. Uh, they are all uh, many of them are of Indian origin. Uh, and of course, in the rank and file, a lot of them have made tons of money, hundreds of millions, billions of dollars they've made. So India, in a sense, has sold out. I mean, this is very sad. It's the, it, India has sold out, or at least a large portion of the people have sold out. They become part of this global elite. And, and they are betraying their own heritage that produce the genius in them. And they've sold out. So it's very sad to me uh, 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 as an Indian. And also, this is a significant story to bring out before it's too late. I hope that some people will change, it, change course. It's significant to bring out because India is also seen as a role model for other developing countries. A lot of Latin American and Asian and African countries have looked up to India as a good case study where you get out of colonialism, you become a democracy, you industrialize, you build an economy, educate your people, and you know they start doing well. So there is that India story, which every Indian is proud of, justifiably so. But as it gets compromised, if it gets compromised along the lines that I fear, then you know the India story is lost even for the rest of the world. So I, I for all these reasons, I made India my case study in this book and also in the next book. Uh, in order to warn people that, uh, you know, the India of uh, the past that we knew has changed, that India sort of disappearing. And for the be for better or worse, there is this whole new kind of India emerging and there could be some problems. 
So your next book, I, I, it's my understanding that you really go into this. Uh, yes. You had written a previous book called Breaking India. Uh, it looks like this is subtitled Breaking India 2.0. If, if you had, had, had taken other uh, countries as an example, you could have called it alligators in the swamp or rats in the closet or cockroaches in the kitchen or psychos in the boardroom. Uh, but culturally, you chose to call it snakes in the Ganga. So first of all, before we dive into this, can you tell people where is the best place for them to get access to both of these books? So you can go to uh, you can go to Amazon. Amazon has them. You go to Amazon and you can buy this uh, artificial type artificial intelligence in the future of power. It's available. Uh, you can go to Amazon and buy snakes in the Ganga. Uh, you you could go to this for snakes in the Ganga because it hasn't been released yet. You can go to www.snakesintheganga.com, and that is our website. And we're taking pre-orders, and we'll start shipping them as soon as the book is out. So people are. I would love to have people in this show go and buy themselves a copy. Yes, please, please do. I've I've uh, I've pre-ordered one already. I really look forward to reading that. And I, I understand that you will be uh, starting soon on a tour uh, beginning in India to spread the word on this book. Can you talk about that? Yes. So uh, the plan is uh, I'm leaving next week uh, and uh, 26th of September, we're doing a launch. Then on the 30th, we are doing another big event. And then I go from Delhi to Bangalore to Chennai to Ahmedabad, four cities we'll do. And then I'll I'll come back next year for more because I didn't want to crowd up too much. We have about a dozen or more events already in India. I come back to the United States in, at the, in late October. And then November, December, we are touring the United States and Canada. Uh, we have fixed up uh, many events in uh, Toronto, uh, then in Boston, in the Harvard area, uh, New York, New Jersey. We're going to the Bay Area, Southern California, uh, Texas, Florida, Michigan, North Carolina, Atlanta. These are some of the places where events are being fixed up. And then we go back to India next year and also Europe. We have various places in Europe that are lining up for this. So it's going to be a busy six months. And I'd love to have you come along for as many of these as you want to, because I think we have a story to tell. Uh, we both can make a good kind of pair of speakers. We can talk about different aspects of it, your experience, my experience. Uh, and so that's what this uh, this whole new book campaign is for. Well, thank you. And thanks for that invitation. I, th I think it could be exciting for people to hear two guys of our ages. I, I looked it up and, you, and uh, I'm three years older than you, um, but we're both hanging in there pretty well. That's an ambitious schedule that you just set out. So you're obviously still very, very energized, but I think it could be very helpful to, uh, for people to hear uh, elder guys with multiple facets to their backgrounds who've come to such similar conclusions uh, about what's really going on, about uh, the challenges, and also about uh, some of the ways that we could solve these problems. So before we get to the solutions, I want to go a little deeper into some of the things that I think you, you, well, you cover, I think, in both books, but especially in the second one. I've only read the final chapter because that was all that was available, um, but you do somewhat of a summary in there. So I feel like I have somewhat of a feel for the book. So uh, one of the things I want to ask you about while we're talking about India as the battleground is fill us in a little bit uh, on what has been the history of Western philanthropy in India. So, you know, Western philanthropy is often a mask for social engineering. Yeah. Uh, I mean, philanthropy is like that anyway, <laughs> a lot of places. Yeah. And a lot of this so-called impact investing, you know, they're impacting in, in accordance with their own ideology, their own value system. But that may be okay, may not be okay. It depends on who is the person creating that impact and who, who's, whose idea of uh, the value it is, you know. So in India, the westernization uh, has uh, killed local languages, attacked local faiths and spiritual traditions, uh, you know, local uh, uh, ways of life. And this is true all over the world. In fact, India is one of the, one of the many targets. And so Western philanthropy, when they send when they send out people, these Harvard trained people or wherever they train, they have this uh, liberal arts ideas based on the Western thought. 
and they try to evaluate that and they try to uh, give grants to those Indians who are like them. And so Indians try to behave more and more American uh, in order to get the money. Uh, and so they kind of uh, become Americanized and become alienated from their own grassroots. Uh, and many of and this creates tensions. This creates uh, social tensions, communal, communal violence even. Uh, it's a, then it's a new category of haves and have nots that are created. Those who are Americanized and privileged in all this and those who are not. Many NGOs are uh, living off of the you know, funding they get from the Western countries. And so they're spending more time trying to impress the Western donor than to being genuine and real and doing actual work. I mean, yeah. there are some, yeah. some communities where uh, they need help. They are really in trouble. They, they are, they are they're genuinely in the socio demographics. They are downtrodden. They need more help. But the leaders are not helping them. They're sitting in Harvard and they're enjoying some limelight and giving speeches. And, you know, so there is this white guilt that says that I want to help those people, uh, but I don't have the time to worry about all the details. And this guy seems like, and he's a, he's a brown skinned guy and he seems like he, he's, uh, he's saying the right things. And this guy's picked up what I want to hear. <laughs> so right. he's just telling me what I want to hear and I keep funding him and feeding him. I don't know what the heck this, where this money is going. So the westernized, Western control of uh, philanthropy has a lot of problems. And then there are some other issues like, you know, Bill Gates managing all the seeds. And, and, and I'm so glad you, I'm so glad in your documentary, you featured uh, Vandana Shiva. She's a dear friend of mine. And, and uh, we've had many, my very first book, she, she was involved in launching in, in, in there. And, and now I'm going to go back and talk to her again. Uh, so she's been a fighter of this whole corporatization of farming and seeds and fertilizers and food uh you see so i think the uh, and and she's considered she's on the radar of all these people they don't like her right. okay so a lot of us are on that <laughs> radar uh because she's telling the she's resisting this uh business of uh uh you know what bill gates is up to as an example i mean i i don't want to be hating anybody bill gates is a nice guy he's made his money the hard way and he has a right to spend it how he wants to, uh, but we have a right to criticize it. I mean, he has a right to his point of view and put his money where his mouth is. And we have a right to critique and evaluate it and say there are some good things about it, but there's some bad things about it. So as far as Bill Gates is concerned, the largest collection of genetic databases is done by two people. One is uh, Bill Gates and the other is the Chinese. The Chinese have got their outposts in India and Africa and everywhere. And in the guise of giving you a, a free uh, test of COVID uh, uh, and genetically sequencing the COVID in you or giving you some free shot of something, uh, they are doing all this database gathering. And when you build genetic databases of 8 billion people in the world, this is the biggest database that, can, that human beings are thinking of collecting so far. It's bigger than all any man-made database of things because each human being is so much data. There's, you look at all the people, it's a lot of data. And this is what then can be used to simulate uh, this particular molecule or this particular aspect of the molecule. What will it do to this race or that race or males or females or people of this kind or that kind? So you can literally sit on a dashboard one day and you can custom make a, 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 a kind of... A, a virus that will attack certain people and not attack certain people. Uh, 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 some kind of a solution that will help the life of this, this group of people if they pay for it and not that group of people because they haven't paid for it. So this business of, uh, you know, psychologists tries to profile people in mind. Genetics profiles the whole body in far great, greater detail. And so understanding the genomes of all the human beings on the planet is this project. And it's not something that average guys, you know, we guys cannot go, we don't have the wherewithal to go out and do all this, but the only certain people do. And so uh, I think that this, uh, this business about philanthropy, they buy off the reviews, they, they run the philanthropy journal, they, they organize the philanthropy conferences. So, you know, it, there's hardly any truly independent, neutral evaluation and critique of what's going on. So, so philanthropy in this context could be referred to as kind of a wolf in sheep's clothing. You know, you say the right things, 
Um, but then the actual agenda ends up destroying many lives. While we're on that theme, uh, I'd like to, you to talk a little bit about ESG and about the impact of something like ESG in India as an Leandro, example. Leandro, if you can hear me, I'd like you to pause it to here for a moment. Okay, great. Thank you. I, <laughs> I got so absorbed in the conversation again, <clears throat> kind of lost track of time here, but I think that this is a good place for us to pause and we're about halfway through and you can see we're we're starting to go pretty deep here and there's exciting stuff coming we're going more into the world economic forum and blackrock uh and their takeover how ai will be um, embedding the values of the global oligarchs if, if if we let them um and we'll also look at uh what can we do about this what are the alternatives uh, as we go into the second section. But for now, um, I think we need to close down the public platforms and transition over for any of those of you who want to check out the Freedom Portal, who want to continue to hear the rest of this conversation uh, and be involved in the Q&A um, at the end. Uh, now's the time, and I'm going to turn it over to Leandro, who will show you a little a uh, taste of what else goes on on the Freedom Portal and then give you instructions on how to make the transition to rejoin the show. All right, guys, I'm gonna go ahead and uh, show this Freedom Portal teaser so you get a sense of what it's like to be a member of our community here. Just a sec. The key is freedom. We are in a lethal mess right now in the world. They're lying and we know they're lying and they know that we know that they're lying, yet still they lie. Did you see what Fauci said? Did you see what the WHO did? Things that start bubbling up that I just feel like I need to communicate with somebody because there's all this crazy <laughs> stuff happening. Media is the greatest enemy and is the greatest tool being used against us. A lot of people are probably familiar now with the World Economic Forum saying, well, you'll own nothing and you'll be happy, but these people plan to own everything. But we forget that underneath that are a bunch of scared children who have yeah. nuclear mm -hmm. weapons and biological weapons and now artificial intelligence. Technocracy and understanding that is really a doorway into the whole next level of red pill. And that's one of the reasons why we're pushing so hard to, to expose this stuff and also to surface what are the ethical guidelines by which we can actually proceed harmoniously with the benefits of AI without falling prey to this authoritarian agenda. This effort towards globalism and global governance is an effort to create extreme centralization. So a response to that is to decentralize. The main promise that got me involved in the cryptocurrencies was the liberation and sovereignty of our species. I think it's the most important topic on the planet right now. How can we create a universal morality that can actually guide us through all these different questions? We are being connected by something much greater than ourselves. People are gathering around truth and freedom because it's critical that we do. Imagine the amount of human energy, creativity, liberation, release from fear. We've got love. We've got the truth and we've got the life force on our side. And ultimately that is gonna be unstoppable even if it's ugly in the transition. We're changing the world. That's what's up and the stakes have never been higher. The good news is that this is still a story in the making. Okay, and I will go ahead and walk those of you who aren't usually with us through the process of uh, actually being able to subscribe, become a member with us, and rejoin the conversation. Okay, so uh, basically you're gonna go to thriveon.com, and uh, once you do, you'll be able to click Start Trial and it's gonna take you to this page where you have your choice of uh, subscription options. Now you can either be an, uh, an explorer or an angel, you can be monthly or annual, so you can go ahead and make that selection. 
And then uh, once you do, of course, we're gonna um, we need a credit card as with most subscriptions, um, but you know, it's a, it's a free trial. So if you decide you um, don't wanna be a part of the community, then you're uh, free to just remove that. But um, we're pretty confident that you will. Well, we, we do a lot of great things here and uh, the community is absolutely fantastic. So um, once you get to the next page, you can go ahead and click sign in to continue. Um, you don't want to click the access now because, uh, you know, you just uh, went ahead and subscribed. So you're just going to click that, log in with the credentials you just mm -hmm. set. And then that'll take you back to the event page where uh, you'll actually be able to click attend. And this is the, the event page for the previous event, but of course you'll just um, click on the one for today. And... It'll take you to the page where you can actually click the join webinar link, and that's going to bring you back into the Zoom with us so you can uh, continue to be a part of the conversation and uh, see what it's like to be in the chat with us. Uh, it's, it's incredible as always. Today is uh, especially um, significant and connecting. So um, we hope you guys decide to join us. Um, thanks for being with us on our public platforms. Okay, thanks, Leandro. And while uh, those people 